Coming up on this week's episode of TechSnap, the sad state of SMTP encryption. A huge batch of flaws have been found in just about every home router. And yes, we have the first reviews of Intel's new Broadwell desktop processors. Then a great big batch of your questions, a rock and roundup, and much, much more on this week's episode of TechSnap. Hi everyone and welcome to TechSnap. This is episode 217 of Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly systems network and administration podcast. We stream this episode live on June 4th, 2015. This episode is brought to you by our three fine sponsors, DigitalOcean, Ting, and IX Systems. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this here show goes on our live stream. Why, that's powered by the incredible Scale Engine over at ScaleEngine.com. You've got to go check that out. My name is Chris and joining us every single week is our host, the admin, the tech, and the teacher, Mr. Alan Jude. Hey there, Alan. Hey, Chris, everybody. Thanks How you for doing, Alan? Are you okay? okay? Are your fingers sore? Because we have a huge show today. I mean, yeah, you, we you, do. I wrote all of the notes. Yeah, you wrote a lot of stuff today. I can't wait to get into it. And we have so much to cover. And our first one is one of my favorite soapboxes to get up on. It's the sad state mm -hmm. of email encryption. And privacy is more important than ever these days. And one of our most important privacy inboxes is our email inbox. All of our password resets go there, Alan. Everything goes in the email inbox. So yeah. when you think about starting to get things encrypted and getting things private, you got to think about SMTP. you got to think about the email. So, Alan, I'm sure we're doing really good in this regard. Everything's tops, right, Alan? No, not oh. even a little bit. <laughs> what do we have? Yes. Uh, so this is an article uh, by a security researcher talking about the problems with the way that uh, transport encryption for email works. So this isn't actually encrypting the content of your email so that nobody can read it except for the person you sent it to. It's just the uh, transport encryption used between your mail client to the server you send it to and between that server and the server they send it to right. and, and so on. Yeah, so, so like if you send an email... just to prevent the NSA from reading it sure. uh, as it crosses the internet. So if you're, an, if you're a Gmail user and you send an email to Hotmail or Yahoo... Right, yeah. you, this would be the encryption... Well, Gmail is kind of a bad example. Uh, so if you're using a regular email provider or something, you're using Outlook or Thunderbird or something or whatever, uh, then it's the encryption between your client to, the, to your ISP's mail server. And then, uh, so that's one step. And then mm -hmm. it's decrypted there, processed, and then sent. And then they might also use encryption to send it from there to, say, Gmail. Right. And then, uh, you know, if you're using the imap or gmail on a phone or something then there would be the ssl that goes from gmail to you when you read it um but the problem is you know when email was invented in the 80s <laughs> there was no encryption and everything right. was just done in plain text what, what was well, there to worry about in the 80s alan everything was yeah. going to be fine well uh the biggest thing is you know because we've started using this and it's what everybody uses it's not really possible to change Right, like everybody would love to replace SMTP with something different. No, but we're but sort of nobody can agree on what that would be, and more importantly, how we would actually ever get there. Can you imagine today? I mean, today like it would be an it would be a service API. System. It would be like Inbox. It would be something new that would be launched. You wouldn't expose this common protocol that all the different carriers and vendors would use. It would be uh, some big player like a Facebook or a Google would come in and implement the new standard, and then they would work with partners to get a group of partners who supported the new standard and the more partners they got, that would be the new system. And that would be the only way you'd replace today's email and that would be atrocious. It would be... No, it I would, think it would... But uh, people could come up with a protocol. The problem would be getting people to switch. I don't think they would. That's my point yeah. is I don't think well, that even can happen in, anymore. Until almost every single person you would want to email is on the new system, yeah. why would you use the new system? Right, right. And, and, and who's going to push that forward? What, what special mm -hmm. interest group wants to create a standard that everybody's going to be able to use like that, a protocol that everybody can yep. use like that? And then, then, and then one that's secure, that everybody agrees is secure? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, in order to solve part of the problem, uh, we did what's called opportunistic encryption. Okay. So when you connect to the mail server, as part of the message it sends at the beginning, it includes the word start TLS if it supports encryption. And then all your client or the other server you're talking to has to do is say the command start TLS, and then the both switch to talking encrypted. Ah, uh, lovely, right. Right? So this is a way to do it backwards compatible, right? Because yeah. if, if you just connect to a mail server and start talking encrypted to it, it's going to be like, huh, I don't speak encrypted. I, all I'm, you're just sending me gibberish. Right, yep. What is right? this? Uh, so you start regular, find out if the other side supports it, and then switch to encryption. Right, that makes sense. The problem with that is 
you're doing the you're deciding whether to use encryption or not based on an unencrypted message. Well, the other thing, uh, you know, the reason we use TLS isn't just because it provides encryption. Other things it provides include authentic or um, uh, integrity checking. So you can be sure that the message hasn't been modified in transit. So specifically, um, you know, some Cisco firewalls will actually you know, when they sit between the client and the server, mm -hmm. they'll see the start TLS command uh, or start TLS uh, advertisement from the server saying it supports it, and they'll delete that and just send the whole message through without that one keyword in it. Oh, really? So that the client won't do encryption, so the Cisco box can scan the emails for viruses, and ah, also yes. Uh, yes. in their enterprise stuff, it it makes sure that they're not emailing out files that they're not supposed to. Right, I've heard of this. They're stealing your data? Yeah, yeah. Because uh, we will be uh, one phone provider was being accused of it. Remember? It was, uh, it was one of the cellular ones. It was like yeah, uh, one of the cellular ones that was a competitor to Ting. Yeah, and they yeah, were, and they were. And I think it was actually AT and T was it, that was doing it for them. Cricket or something. was it? And cricket is that? I think that, it was Cricket. Yes. That, yeah. Okay. Um, but yeah, and we found out then that there are some Cisco firewalls that do it as well. And so, if you're in this case being man in the middle attacked, mm -hmm. uh, they can just delete that one line from the other side, and then nobody will ever speak encrypted. Right. And so that doesn't really work. Um, so maybe what we actually need is something like the HSTS header we added to HTTP, um, you know, where we said this website will always have encryption. So I've talked to the website once before I was being attacked. Right. And so, um, I know, and it says this header it's, for the next, you know, year, never, ever connect me without SSL. Uh, so maybe if we had something like that so that we could then detect those men in the middle attacks hmm. and be like, hey, this server said it would always be encrypted, and it's not. Right. So I'm I can, just going to not talk to it right Something now. that says I can guarantee you that for a year you're always going to get an encrypting c c connection. If that doesn't happen, then you're not talking to me, regardless of what anything else says. Is that kind of what you're implying? Right. I like yeah, that. Kind of like, well, we, we have that for HTTP already. Sure, yeah. But right. why, why, and why SMTP. wouldn't Microsoft or Google do that? They're going to be around for a year. But That's, the problem is... That, that that gets remembered in your browser. Yeah. Um, well, are you going to make your email server remember that setting for every remote server it's ever talked to? Well, or your mail client. So for most people, well, that'd be Outlook or Thunderbird. Do it. Yeah. yeah. Outlook or Thunderbird could do it the same way the browser does. Right. But on a mail server, that could get a little trickier. Yeah, for sure. And and uh, yeah, especially for web mail, and if you're moving around a lot from different computers and whatnot, mm -hmm. you'd have to. You'd almost have to have something. What about like something like a root a root certificate where the browser, you know, you, the browser ships with an awareity. Like if it, if you're talking a limited set of vendors like Google, Apple, Microsoft, Facebook, etc., they could bake that into the browser. Right. Well, so you know uh, the the mail servers have SSL certificates and so on, but you don't always know they support it or whatever, right? Yeah. Basically, because port 25 is defined as being SMTP plain text, when you connect there, you can't just start speaking encrypted. Now, it seems that, you know, uh, most mail servers will actually have a separate port where they list on SSL only, but it's not quite standardized enough where we could just say, try that first, or right. always try that. Whatever. Right. Especially since, uh, you know, if that's black hole by a firewall or something, it could take two minutes to time out, and, you know, that's just... You yeah, know. yeah, that's you true. Don't want mail servers like poking a bunch of different ports to try and then falling back to part twenty-five. Or yeah, something. this is going to take forever. But that brings up the point: uh, if you do know it has that uh, in my Thunderbird, I don't actually send mail out on port twenty-five. There's actually more than one reason for this. Uh, the first one was ISPs used to block that, or most still do, right? They yeah. don't allow you to send mail on port twenty-five except to their mail server. Right. Well, uh, so that caused people to use a different port like uh, 586 or something like that, uh, 587. Uh, but also there's an SSL-only version of that. I think it's port 465 or something like that. Mm. Uh, it's the default if you check SSL-only in most email clients. And so that's what I use. So when my Thunderbird goes to talk to my server, it's set up so it won't accept the connection if it's not SSL always from the beginning. There you go. So it doesn't the start TLS thing. It just connects on a port that's always going to be SSL and that, then talks to it. That seems like a really great setting to have on a laptop. So, yeah, that's great on my phone and my laptop and my yeah. desktop and so on. But it doesn't really help if then, so the email goes securely from my computer to my server, but then when my server sends it to Gmail, it sends it in plain text. Right. Right? Because yeah. somebody's yeah. doing it in the middle and yeah. deleting Google saying that they do encryption. Yep. That's, yeah. <laughs> I know. So, that's the problem. That's, the weakest link is always going to be the issue in that chain. Yeah. But that's only the beginning of the problem. <laughs> 
So SSL and TLS are designed to provide three different guarantees. First, authenticity. Prove that you're talking to who you think you're talking to. I'm actually talking to Gmail, not someone pretending to be Gmail. Uh, this is provided by verifying that the SSL certificate that Gmail gives you is actually issued by a trusted certificate authority. Well, you know, some mail servers don't actually have a certificate uh, store installed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, because, you know, for example, OpenSSL doesn't ship with a list of trusted certificates because they decided they didn't want to be responsible for managing that list and telling you who to trust. Right. So if you don't install the NSS cert store from, from Mozilla or whatever, you don't really have a list of who to trust. And also, a lot of mail servers just are use self-signed certificates or whatever. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. so people aren't going to buy. You know, they want the encryption, but they're mm -hmm. not worried so much about the authenticity. Especially on a lot of small business ones where you know you've got a dozen users or more, and you just wanted something like an IMAP server and an LDAP server. You self-sign that certificate. I mean, come on, why not? Yeah. You just tell the users, click, you're okay, it's fine. The and the integrity, you're just not getting authenticity. Yeah, and, and you know, and you know, it's fine. It's fine. It's not a big deal. You know, that's actually important on my phone, for example. We actually do have a real certificate for our mail server. Yeah. So when I see a fake one, yeah. I know that the hotel I'm at is trying to intercept my communications. Mm -hmm, which is the becoming more and more common. Anyway. Right. right. So oftentimes the capture portals cause all kinds of havoc with SSL. Yep. But yep. Anyway. So the three guarantees are authenticity that we just talked about, integrity, that is the message has not been modified or tampered with uh, during transit, right? We use a message authentication code or MAC, which is basically a signed hash that proves that the original person sent this message and it hasn't been changed in any way since then. Mm -hmm. That's the one we need to make sure that they're not deleting that start TLS line or something. Right. That we don't get that when we do it in plain text. Uh, so this makes sure that, you know, not only is the message I'm sending to my mail server encrypted, but nobody's modifying it, right? Because if they could, they could just change the destination of the encrypted email to be them and yeah. they would get a copy instead or whatever. <laughs> Add themselves as a, a BCC yeah. to all the emails or something. Why not? Right. And the third one is the one that most people know about, which is the privacy, right? That's encrypting the content of the message uh, using symmetric encryption and with SSL and TLS that the key for that symmetric encryption is actually negotiated using the SSL certificate as a key. Uh, so... Yeah, like we said, uh, mail servers actually rarely check the authenticity that makes sure that the SSL certificate matches for a couple of different reasons. Partly because, you know, people use self-signed certificates, but also because a lot of people don't host their own email, right? You know, for example, Jupyter Broadcasting emails hosted at Google. Mm -hmm, Google Apps. Uh, but a lot of people, when they do something like that, they'll use what I call a vanity record. So, you know, the mail server for whatever.com will actually be mail.whatever.com, which is then a C name or whatever to Gmail. So that when you do a lookup at it, it doesn't look like they're using Gmail or whatever. Yeah. Uh, or especially same with like, you know, if you're getting uh, your email hosting from your, uh, the place you bought your domain or anything like that. Well, the way they check in, um, because in SSL, you have to have the host name has to match on the certificate. They don't use the host name of the email, right? You don't check that the certificate on the mail server is issued by the domain of the person you're sending an email to, right? Right, yes. It, it, the, when you talk to Google, you're not actually talking to a server that has the certificate for gmail.com. The mail server only has a certificate for, you know, like asp47.googlemail.com or mm -hmm. something like that, mm -hmm. longer hosting. Uh, so you actually check based on the MX record uh, where it points. But even then, it doesn't necessarily match, especially if you say you're an email hosting provider that hosts a thousand small businesses with ten users each. You're not going to have a thousand. S you're not going to have one SSL certificate that lists all one thousand of those domains. Right. It's just cumbersome, right? Uh, and so that makes it harder there, um, and it gets all kinds of messy. Uh, so even if we did enforce mm -hmm. checking the MX record name against the certificate, and so people would have to put the na the you know the one true name of their hosting provider. Um, even if we did enforce that. Uh, that could cause and you know reject uh, all mail sent by self-signed servers or whatever without DNSSEC to make sure that the DNS records aren't being messed with. Mm -hmm. Someone could just uh, do a man in the middle and replace the mail server's lookup. Oh, of, of course, the mail server for Jupiter. Especially if you, especially if it's and, a LAN and you own the DNS. Right, but basically, yeah. Uh, when somebody went to email JupiterBroadcasting.com, instead of getting the Gmail server. The man in the middle attack could just replace that name with mx1.evilguy.com. 
Oh, I like that one, Alan. Valid SSL certificate <laughs> for the domain yeah. mx1.evilguy.com. Yeah. And so now, instead of my email being sent to Chris, it's been intercepted and sent to the bad guy, and it was all encrypted and worked fine. But he has the email now. So in the end, the best solution will be using DNSSEC so that we could periodically sign our DNS results and we know those aren't forged. And then with that, using Dane, uh, which is kind of a, the way of replacing certificate authorities as the trust anchor. Mm -hmm. And instead, what we would do is the certificate, the self-signed certificate that is the right one for jupiterbroadcasting.com or whatever, right. will be published as a text record in DNS. Right, And so then when you get this certificate and you're like, this isn't in my trust store, you can check in DNS, oh, but it is the right one for jupiterbroadcasting.com, and that's we verified that with DNSSEC, and mm -hmm. that was definitely issued by the real jupiterbroadcasting.com, and basically that replaces the certificate authorities with the domain registrars. So, so do you think is that a, is that trading one evil for another, or do you think there's enough market competition with domain name registrars right now that it's it's okay? Well, I think the DNSSEC actually ends up going up into the root registries, so there's less chance of silliness, but because the registrar does have the ability, they could just change your key and do weird things. Yeah. Although it definitely seems less likely. I mean, but, I go back yeah, to we've, we've could, seen... No matter what the entity is, governments could kind of force them to do something. So. I guess so. I guess you, yeah. You, no, you we've did, seen yeah. domains get taken over by the government before, right? That was what I was going to say, but you're right. It, it, it could be any entity, I suppose, couldn't it? Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know that there's any entity we could trust not to get pressured by one government or another. Right. And I guess, but I, in some ways, I like that thing because then consumers have more choice in the matter. So. Well, the interesting thing is with Dane, you don't, yeah, you're not having to pay for a certificate. Right. It's just, use it, you already paid for the domain. You set up your DNSSEC and then you can just publish. This is a certificate that's the right one for Jupyter Broadcasting. Yeah. Well, actually, Anna, I would just have you do that part because that sounds really complicated. I don't want to have to manage that at well, all. Uh, luckily, the, the guy I co-wrote the uh, ZFS book with has a book called DNSSEC Mastery that explains how to do it. So you mean the ZFS book you wrote at zfsbook.com? Is that the book you're yes, talking about? Oh, it. okay. Oh, okay, that book. But it, uh, on his website, he sells a bunch of other books that are also very, very good. Well, Alan, any other thoughts on that particular story? Right. Uh, so mm. just uh, on the DNSSEC plus stain thing, then we still get the three protections. Uh, you know, we still get the integ or the um, yeah the integrity and the privacy from encryption uh, in the Mac. But uh, instead of having to use a certificate authority to verify the right one, we can use DNSSEC and the Dane record to verify that we're right. actually talking yeah. to the right mail server yeah. without having to press certificate authorities. So maybe it's an advantage. Uh, the other big point they make is, you know, most people are like, yeah, well, a man in the middle between me and Google is probably not that likely and so on. But... You know, we've seen the ongoing problem of the BGP hijacking, yeah. where a range of IP addresses will be routed to the wrong place. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've seen that people do that to like fish banks and, and so on. It can happen but, accidentally, Alan. Yes, it can happen accidentally, and it can happen on purpose, and it can take weeks for it to get fixed. Well, if it's happening in such a way that the traffic actually does eventually end up in the right place, it's much less likely to be noticed. Right? Mm hmm. So if you if you hijacked Gmail and then all of a sudden you were not giving the right SSL certificate or something, people would flip out. Right. But if you did it and still routed the traffic to Google, then you could strip that start TLS thing and a bunch of email would end up going into Gmail without the encryption. Right. Or more likely you would do it to someone not as big as Gmail that's going to take longer to notice. Like, you know, a smaller ISP, like <laughs> Frontier or something. Yeah, or, uh, you know, it, it, again, I go back, it doesn't even have to be an ISP, it could be somebody on the LAN, right? I, yes. I, yeah. Or you just, yeah, and you could do it to, uh, or another good one would be like a smaller sh uh, a hosting provider. Right. Where, you know, lots of people right. have their mail server. Yes. Ooh. Oh, Alan, you're so mischievous. I'm glad you're on the good side, Alan, because that is mischievous. Because well, uh, imagine the biggest one <laughs> is if you could do this. Yeah. Or password resets. Oh, like sure, sure. Here, right? So if I'm intercepting uh, the mail as it's leaving Facebook or something, or on its way from Facebook to somewhere. So, or for example, you have Jupyter Broadcasting. If I could hijack uh, that one, if you weren't hosted at Gmail for your email, then I could go to Facebook, reset your password, and knowing that I couldn't access your email account to get it, but then if I was stripping the SSL... I could intercept the email Facebook sent you and get the link or the temporary password that right. they emailed you. Right, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely you could. 
That's that's why I say the inbox is like your your most important box of secrets. Like people really have to understand how critical that inbox is, and this is why it's such a critical part of this. Mr. Jude, any other thoughts on that particular story? Nope. All right, then, Alan. Well, then I would like to take just a moment and tell you about our first sponsor this week, and that is Ting. Ting is mobile that makes sense. Ting is my mobile service provider, and I'd like it to be your mobile service provider, too. Here's what I love about it. You only pay for what you use. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, and your megabytes, and they add them up at the end of the month in whatever bucket you fall into. My friends, that's all you have to pay. Now, think about this. It's a flat $6 for your phone line. When's the last time you heard about having a cell phone for $6 a month? I, 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 that, that, I don't even think they've ever been that cheap. That blows my mind. So that's what you get. You pay for $6. There's no contract, no early termination fee. You just pay for what you use. $6, your minutes, messages, megabytes, boom, that's it. Plus, Ting has some of the best management tools out there, you'd think they're a super, super expensive service with how elegant their management solution is. And then to top it all off, they have a no-hold customer service. You call them at 1-855-TING-FTW anytime between 8 a.m. or 8 p.m. That's uh, that's Alan, East Coast time. And a real human being answers your phone. So go to techsnap.ting.com and for a limited time, you'll get a $50 service credit off your first Ting device. Or if you're a boss and you already have a Ting compatible device, and you might because they have a huge GSM network and CDMA network, then you're going to get a $50 service credit. Well, let me tell you something. $25 is what I got for my service credit, and that more than paid for my first month. So if you're getting a $50 service credit, you're going to be rolling in it for a while. And you might as well pick up a MiFi adapter or something like that, too. Oh, 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 oh. speaking of things you might want to pick up on Ting. Remember how I was saying Ting has a GSM network now? They've got mm-hmm. the Galaxy S6 Edge. Now, Alan, you know me. I like my toys. So I got myself the Galaxy S6 Edge on the Ting network. Holy crap, this is it. This is such a cool phone. And let me tell you, as a parent, I super, super love the camera on this thing. So uh, one of the things I love about this phone is it's a single two tap. You tap right there and it instantly launches the camera as fast as the eight core processor possibly can. And the camera is one of the best cameras out there. And the other thing for all of you hipsters, you're going to love this, is check it out. It totally has a selfie mode where it recognizes my face and I can be like, hi. And I can tweet that and it it literally says up in the screen it says selfie and it like you can go in there and it'll apply like makeup texturizer to your face and stuff automatically now I I I don't Chris doesn't Chris doesn't do that no I don't don't do that this is all about the makeup no I don't do that I don't do that but you can there's a little slider in there and it makes you look better now that's not why you're gonna buy the phone it's just a really great phone and now you can get it on the ting network for no freaking contracts and no early termination fees you just pay for what you use unlocked you own this computer like a full-fledged device and when you got three gigabytes of ram and an eight core processor i think it's time to call this a full-fledged computer so go to techsnap.ting.com that'll take fifty dollars off any device you want If you're a boss, you can get the S6 Edge. It is a slick device. They've got a bunch of other great devices, too, including the regular S6 and budget GSM phones. Check out the new Blue Studio Mini. This is such a great compromise. It's got a quad-core 1.2 gigahertz processor, 4.5-inch display, nice display, 5-megapixel camera. You ready for this? $111. No contract. You just own that phone outright. It's unlocked. For $111, you can get a quad-core 1.2 gigahertz Android smartphone on the Ting network. This has never been a better time to come become a Ting customer with that $50 service credit. So go to techsnap.ting.com right now. Techsnap.ting.com supports this show, and it gets you that $50 service credit. Keeps us on the air and gives you a great deal. Techsnap.ting.com. And a big thank you to Ting for sponsoring the TechSnap program. Okay, Mr. Jude. So now we're going to move into the area of flaws and network devices. <laughs> what could go wrong here? I'm sure there's yes, nothing you to know report. Those home routers that everybody has <laughs> telling you are terrible. Well, they're even more terrible than we thought. Uh oh. All right. It's just I'm ready. Horrible. I'm ready. I'm ready. Yes. Uh, so researchers at uh, the Universidad de Europa uh, in <laughs> Mid- Madrid, Spain, have published their research in which they found that the 22 most common consumer network devices in Spain are vulnerable to a total of 60 flaws. Uh, So these are a group of researchers working on their IT master's uh, thesis, or IT security master's thesis at the university, and they found uh, serious flaws in 22 different Soho networking devices. Shocked, Alan, I'm shocked. from uh, D-Link, Belkin, Linksys, Huawei, Netgear, Zizel, etc., 
Uh, most of the devices they surveyed are the ones distributed by ISPs in Spain. Uh, so these vulnerabilities have a very large impact since almost every internet user in Spain will have one of the 22 devices they tested against. Uh, across them, they found 11 different types of vulnerabilities, including persistent uh, cross-site scripting, which is, for example, on the one router, um, it has a thing where you can go in and block a website by its name. Well, if you write some HTML into that box, then every time you load that page, that HTML runs, and you can actually uh, exploit somebody's machine with that. No. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't even know how you managed to surprise me with this. I think every time you give me one of these stories, I'm like, okay, yeah, not surprised, not yeah. surprised. Then they have surprise. uh, unauthenticated cross-site scripting, which would allow someone to uh, inject code into the router screens. Uh, cross-site request forgery, which would allow someone to, while you're on some evil web page on the internet that maybe you got fished to, yeah, it would allow that page to trick you into posting directly to your. Um, your firewall device and changing a setting. With, like, whereas normally with cross-site request forgery prevention stuff, if you didn't submit the form originally on the router, it wouldn't let it apply to the router. Yeah. Uh, there are also denial of service ones where you could just stop the device from working. Privilege escalation on one of those you could, um, on, in addition to the regular admin account with the default password, there's yeah. also a separate user account with the default password that most people don't know about. Okay. Well, if you FTP into the device as that user, uh, you can download the configuration file, the config.xml, which just so happens to contain the root password in plain text. <laughs> no. And so, yeah. So you go in and change the admin no. password to keep people out. But if you log in as user with the password no, user, you can no. download the config file and find out what no. the admin password is and then just log in as administrator with the password. <gasps> Jeez, how noob could Why they be? Why is it in plain text? Why can an uh, unprivileged user access a sensitive file? It's it's so Just negligent, why, why, it why, almost why. feels intentional. I mean, I'm sure it wasn't. I'm sure mm -hmm. it was raw ignorance. So speaking of intentional, yeah. the next is, uh, one is a backdoor. Oh, jeez. The uh, there's also some information disclosure vulnerabilities, a uh, bypass authentication by using SMB symlinks. If you make a symlink on a SMB that's shared by the device, uh, you can trick it into letting you in because a file exists or points uh, to something. To an area that wasn't normally shared or something? Yeah, or, <laughs> or some file you're not supposed to be able to access. So that's just like a that. straight-up SMB config problem right there. SMB follow yeah, link, well, right? Right, and that, well, it's being built into the SMB that's built into yeah. the router. Yeah. Because right? all these routers now have USB yeah. ports where you can attach a hard drive yeah. and there'll be a file server. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also bypass authentication or bypass the authentication on the device by plugging in a USB. Hmm. You plug in a certain USB and you can do whatever you want on the device without having to log in. And then there's just regular bypassing authentication where you can just change settings without having to log in first. And then almost every one of the devices is vulnerable to some problem with the universal plug and play. Yeah, there's a it's shocker, a huh? Keys. Yeah. So all of this makes me glad that my router is FreeBSD. Yeah, yeah. I mean, how many times have we said yeah. PFSense on this show? Boy. Exactly. Oh, wow. Or uh, the best part is that recently learned about uh, some regular, like, the problem most people have with PFSense is, you know, oh, it's going to be a big box, or I'm going to have to buy something special, or, you know, if I use a, an old PC, it'll consume a lot of power or whatever. And, you know, uh, companies like um, Net... NetGate make little devices uh, to run PFSense, like, and the PFSense store sells them. Uh, but I uh, recently learned that TP-Link makes a device, the WDR3600, uh, which actually has a 560 megahertz MIPS chip. <laughs> uh, but you can reflash it from their firmware to run FreeBSD or a Linux issue like DDWRT. Uh, the big difference with this device is it's got the four port gigabit switch uh, two separate Wi-Fi's, one that does 300, megahertz, uh, 300 megabits at 5 gigahertz, and a separate one that does 300 megabits at 2.4 gigahertz, so you can do both of them at the same time. So, you yep, know, if you yep. have lots of devices yep. and so on, you can actually do wireless N on both separate channels at the same time yeah. to get even more bandwidth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And unlike most other routers, because it's got such a beefy MIPS CPU, it can do 800 megabits per second through its NAT. Oh, I'll take it. Yeah. And... It costs fifty dollars. Wow! Yeah. I did so not expect I, that. I have a crate of fifty or twenty of them in my basement right now, <laughs> uh, and we're taking them to BSD Can, where we're going to solder serial ports onto them, and uh, people have already signed up to buy them all. That's awesome, Alan. You, you know, 
So hold on, are you shipping those? Are you gonna are you gonna check well, no, all no, that? Check. Like we, we did we did a, basically it was a bulk. But we organized it with people that are going to BSD can, and we're like, we found this. Who wants one? And yeah. everybody signed up. Yeah. And then I bought them, and I'm going to take them to BSD. <laughs> I love it. And then we're going to tear them all apart, solder extra, solder a. Got to have a serial port. You got to have it. It's exactly. hey, hey, it is 2015. You have got to have a serial port. Well, they have two USB ports, but we needed a serial port, and it has the header for it. We just had to add the device. <laughs> I like that they didn't even bother connecting it themselves. <laughs> they put the header yeah, on it there. It's there for debugging. Yeah, okay. But wow, so this is a real mess. An extra and extra $10 for the components and wires. And stuff. The list of, of vulnerabilities is still scrolling on the screen. I've never stopped it from oh, yeah. scrolling here. And what uh, strikes me about this, and I know everybody that has listened to this show for a while knows, is, oh, Chris is getting up on that soapbox again. It's the second segment in a row. But listen, you guys. How are you going to go and put the Internet of Things all up in your business when you can't even get this stuff working? Don't tell me about internet, internet connected device. doors and locks. This is the device that's supposed to pr- protect your internet connected door lock yeah. from being attacked over the internet. Yeah. So, so far what I've witnessed is you put internet in my TV and then after about a year or two you fail to update that properly and it runs like crap. You put internet in my lights also, and... You, in- you do update it by injecting ads forcing me not to in- update. Yep. Yep. So I'm just saying, how are you going to go tell me that the Internet of Things is going gonna, is gonna to be the next big revolution to consumer electronics when the previous revolution to consumer electronics is a total, total mess and you haven't even solved the problem? I know I say it all the time, but it just seems like this well, is such a warning thing. sign. Yes. But what we, we need to you know, specify here is what we want is the Internet of Open Source Things. Where, yeah. you know... There are updates and such. That's an interesting. Problem is that's not what people are going to buy in a store, and that's yeah. yeah. Well, hopefully, eventually, that'll be, is what maybe will gain larger traction. Like, I don't know. Sure, but it's like even if it is open source and so on, is my mom going to update her Internet of Things device? <laughs> right. Right. Well, so I guess we really have no other wisdom to leave the audience with, other than stop using uh, the routers. Yeah, buy a device that you can run something serious on like FreeBSD or DDWRT. Right. Well, Mr. Jude, uh, I uh, I have to say I'm the happy. Word, to- though, honestly, is like we talked about at the beginning here, the device is distributed by the ISPs that have these problems or when the ISPs purposely put their own back doors into it. Yeah. Uh, but the, way is, is the problem is when they combine them into the modem and so you can't replace it with your own device. I'm happy to say that both at JBHQ and JB1, uh, we have managed to replace the ISPs, router devices, with dedicated firewalls now. And uh, in both circumstances, we noticed improvements across the board with uploading and downloading multiple large files simultaneously. When we replaced oh, yeah. the, the... Most of those devices have tiny, tiny yeah. amounts of, yeah. of RAM and so yeah. on. And, and most of them, just they have really cheap, small CPUs. That's one of the biggest things about this, that TP-Link one, is that it's a really beefy CPU. Uh, for a device like that, you know, MIPS is really, really good at networking because yes. it's big Indian. Yeah. And network packets on the network are actually big Indian, and a regular like yep. XC computer has to reverse that. Now, it's not that hard of an operation, but when you're trying to do it as cheaply as possible, having a CPU that just doesn't have to do that step saves yeah, an nice. operation. Yeah. All right, Alan. Well, I'll tell you about something else that saves an operation. DigitalOcean, that's our next sponsor on the TechSnap program. DigitalOcean is where I go whenever I need to spin up Linux infrastructure on demand. You're developing something in a container, you're developing something to run on a server, whatever it is, DigitalOcean can do it with their droplets. DigitalOcean is simple cloud hosting, and they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server that you're going to have root access to. You get also, and i got to underscore this, it is fully your rig. I mean, you go up there, you get HTML console from post all the way up to the login screen. You can connect in there and change the password and install anything you want and destroy it if you want to. Although, why would you want to? I don't know. Maybe you just like to, to do those kinds of things. What's the matter with you? Instead, go create something. Make something amazing and beautiful. DigitalOcean is the place to do it, and you can get started in less than 55 seconds. And pricing plans start at only $5 a month. Five dollars. Yeah. Five dollars. I just, I just I just spun up a new mail server. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we we when when we are we're just working on projects for the weekend. I will spin up a server on DigitalOcean just for the weekend. Even uh, it's super flexible like that. And then once I want to keep it in production, the decision to say to say, all right, well, we spun it up over the weekend. I want to keep it. Do I want to spend five dollars? Like it's a no brainer. It's so great, and the fact that I get going so fast makes it really easy. I, for five dollars, I'm gonna get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD. Yeah, I said SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte. 
one terabyte of transfer. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, a brand new one in Germany. And London, of course, actually is pretty new as well. And I don't know what it is about DigitalOcean. If I, if I could have their man-child, I would just because of their UI. Finally, finally, after what I feel like the users fought a battle for a decade to get a UI to do this properly. You've seen so many ways to manage this kind of stuff, but you've never seen it the way DigitalOcean does it. They struck that balance between intuitive and elegant, but yet absolutely powerful. You can set up and deploy yeah, droplets yeah. in seconds. That's the thing I noticed. Like a, a lot of other ones I've noticed, you kind of have that Fisher Pricey feel with all the big buttons and stuff. But the DigitalOcean one is just the right combination of simple, few options, whatever, but all the control you need to actually do stuff. Yeah. And obviously, the best part is getting the real console so that yeah. if something does go wrong, you can do stuff on it. Yeah. And I, I love the one click installations. That's great for uh, when, I, when I recommend a DigitalOcean that, that people to DigitalOcean that aren't like crazy savvy. Uh, between their one-click installations and their tutorials, you are never going to have an issue. And it, it, you just got to go check it out. And when you use our promo code, remember, this is the best part, you guys. Snap Ocean is going to give you a $10 credit. That $5 rig is going to go 10 You can go without even having to put your credit card in there. You're going to be able to go two months absolutely free. And if you created your account and you forgot to use our promo code, use Snap Ocean. And it'll give you a $10 credit. And while you're there, play around in their tutorial section. When you're using that Snap Ocean for that $5 rig two months for free, Look at this one, Alan. How to get started with FreeBSD 10.1. How about yes. that one? There's a great one up there. And, of course, DigitalOcean has support for FreeBSD. This is great. I love that they're sticking with it, too, you know? Really good stuff. Node.js on Ubuntu 14.04. Apache Content Caching on Ubuntu 14.04. You know, DigitalOcean is hiring as well. If you go over to DigitalOcean.com and check out their We're Hiring section, which pops up on their site from time to time, and you just might be able to get a gig, they're also looking for content editors. DigitalOcean.com and use our promo code SNAPOcean. And you get a $10 credit. And a big thank you, DigitalOcean, for sponsoring the TechSnap program. And really... I got to say, tip of the hat for keeping up on the uh, free BSD stuff as well. Mm -hmm. That's really good stuff. I'm glad to see them continuing to push that forward. All right, Mr. Jude, do you want to talk about Blue Cross and the security breach that, I, what was it, like a million customers that were impacted by this 1. one? 1.1 million. 1.1 yeah. million. All so, right. What's uh, going on? Care First Blue Cross Blue Shield last week uh, said they didn't been hit by a data breach that compromised the personal information of about 1.1 million of their customers. Uh, there are indications that the same attack methods may have been used in this intrusion as were used in the uh, Anthem and Primera incidents that have in total now collected data on 90 million Americans. Uh, they said it would be interesting, or I said, uh, you know, it'd be interesting to know if what was common bits of infrastructure or software or whatever uh, maybe were used in these places, like for all of them running this one software or um, insurance industry program that they managed to break into, or what was it? Yeah. Uh, but then Krebs of course, delivers uh, some pretty compelling evidence that kind of suggests where the problem might lie. Uh, so according to a statement from uh, First Care last week, uh, they said attackers gained access to the names, birth date, email address, and insurance identification numbers of the customers. Uh, the company said the database did not include the social security or credit card numbers, passwords, or medical information. Nevertheless, uh, CareFirst is offering credit monitoring and identity theft protection for two years. Oh, there you go. Uh, th I have a cool note about that later on in the story. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so there are uh, clues indicating that the same state-sponsored actors from China uh, thought to be involved in the Anthem and Primary attacks are actually involved in this one. Okay. Uh, as Kreb noted in his uh, February 9th story that I linked here, uh, Anthem was breached not long after a malware campaign was erected that mimicked Anthem's domain name at the time of the breach. So uh, actually, at the end of 2014, Anthem had changed its name. Before that, it was known uh, as WellPoint. Uh, uh, so security researchers at uh, the cyber firm ThreatConnect had uncovered a series of subdomains for the domain wellconnect.com spelled with uh, the number ones instead of the letter L. So we11point.com, uh, including myhr.wellpoint.com and hrsolutions.wellpoint.com. <laughs> oh. So it seems like they probably used those to do phishing attacks against actual employees. Mm. Uh, and, you know, once you get the credentials of an employee's account, then you can go in and do whatever you want. Uh, Threat Connect also found that the domains uh, registered in April 2014, which is about the time the Anthem breach actually started. 
and that the domains were used in conjunction with malware designed to mimic a software tool that many organizations commonly use to allow employees to remote access internal networks. So it might have actually been a malware version of like a VPN client or yeah, something. Oh, I bet. That would not surprise me at all. Uh, Threat Connect also published more information uh, tying the threat actors and the modus operandi to the domain name Prinera.com. Hmm. So the M replaced with two letter N's. Uh, so it seems that the compromise may have been a combination of spear phishing and malware tricking employees into divulging their credentials so they could <laughs> get in. Uh, you know, such attacks on teleworkers is kind of a new thing and it's a little scary, right? Uh, they say the chi same Chinese bulk registrant uh, also bought the domain carefirst.com spelled with the letter I, or sorry, uh, with the letter I replaced with the letter L and with the letter I replaced with the number one. So carefirst and carefir one first. <laughs> <laughs> uh, additionally, Threat Connect also unearthed evidence showing that uh, the tactics were also used against empireblue.com where hmm. the L was replaced with the number one, which was registered back in 2014. Uh, which is the same day as the phony CareFirst domains were bought. Uh, Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield was one of the organizations impacted as part of the Anthem breach. Okay. It all comes together, doesn't it, Alan? Yes. And then they also have um, AnthemFacts.com. Oh, I like that uh, one. Which is uh, the one for uh, people that are victims of this, since there were so many. And the interesting thing I found there is that they're not using Experian, but are actually using the All Clear ID uh, oh. Credit and threat monitoring service. Well, well, well. Which is just interesting. A new contender enters. Yes. <laughs> well, I love Krebs, man. He seems to always have something super solid for us to dig our teeth into every single week. And <clears throat> what I like about this is, in the case of this story in particular, you can tell he was on this, you know, back in February. He was following this. Uh, so props to him. So uh, 1.1 million customers probably means there's some folks in our audience that are impacted by this. So if you are, Alan's got all the details uh, broken down in the show notes for you. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com and look for episode 217 of the TechSnap program, and uh, we'll have this story linked up, but also all of the highlights you need to know, Alan has busted out bullet point by bullet point for your review. Yes. And also with the links to Krebs, who goes into even more detail if you're uh, interested. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I feel like uh, I dodged a bullet on that one because blue. I wasn't. I was a Blue Cross customer, but I don't think I fit into that into that category. Yeah, well, because Blue Cross is basically a giant network yeah. of a bunch of smaller ones. Right. I'm not one of those ones. Whatever. Whatever that is. I guess. Uh, yeah. Huh. All right. Alan, well, any other thoughts on that story? Uh, nope. Okay, well then, can I tell you just a little bit about uh, IX Systems? This week, I am stoked. Probably not. No, no. I'm, you I probably know, know way more than I do, actually. I can't really tell you anything. Well, maybe I could tell the audience tell the something. Audience, yeah, so yeah. IXSystems.com slash TechSnap. That's where you need to go. That'll support this show. Also, it's a great mm. landing page to kind of get an overview of what's great about IX and to download their white paper to help grease that wheel up the uh, management chain. Why we mm -hmm. like IX, they build their rigs around these incredible Xeon processors that just keep getting better and better, and they really have the best quoting system out there. Nobody does it better than the way IX handles the pre-sales and post-sales process. Plus, they do server burn-in. Plus, they have fantastic fanatical support, and they really, truly have some of the best customers out there, because why? They build some of the best solutions out there. That's why Alan uses them over at Scale Engine. And we use them here, too. And, Alan, did you see this? I'm very excited for IX. Uh, they say they're expanding. How about that? Yes. I, really, probably uh, in a big part uh, due to demand in their huge storage project projects and uh, yep. freaking uh, ZFS, man. They needed more uh, support people, and they were already uh, very, very cramped. Uh, so they uh, Look found at that. some more space that nearby. That is adorable. Wow. Basically, added, opened a second office. to, And uh, this also let them... Uh, build out a proper data center for themselves as well. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, we've talked about in the past some of the amazing rigs. They have everything from uh, stuff for your small business or, you know, just somebody who's an enthusiast. Uh, you, you got a free NAS rig at your home, and they're just great machines. They're rock solid, reliable. Also, uh, they, uh, as part of this uh, last week, they had a big uh, hackathon where they pull in their employees that uh, a lot of their employees work from home, you know, like uh, Chris Moore from that does BSD now with me. Yeah, lives on the opposite side of the country from their offices. Yeah, uh, but last week they rented a, a like a cottage and took everybody or a whole ranch actually, and <laughs> took everybody there and spent like a whole week hacking on stuff. And uh, there's huge strides made towards the next version of FreeNAS. 
<laughs> Lots of interesting. I things can't wait to find so. out more. I'm gonna get a little jelly. Well, actually, I guess I'll just upgrade my FreeNAS unit. And you know, it's so cool that the folks behind IX are what's driving that, and so many other amazing initiatives in the open source space that are critical to this area of the business. IX Systems has the people on the bench that make this stuff possible. So why not buy it from them? Plus, you're gonna be so happy once you do it. Go over to ixsystems.com/techsnap and check them out. And I think they're crazy. I think they're gonna be at Self next weekend and at BSD Can next week. Yep. Luckily, their team is big enough they can be in multiple places at once. That's cool. And you know, the JB team is going to be in both places at once, too. So say hi to Alan uh, when you're at BSD Can, and be sure you say hi to uh, Noah when you're down at uh, Self, because Noah and some crew will be down there. And is uh, Chris Moore joining you at BSD Can, I assume? Yes. Yeah. Yep. So you can and say Ken hi. Moore and yeah. lots of other people. Say hi to Chris and Alan at uh, BSD Can, and say hi to uh, Q5 Sys and Noah and others at uh, Self. Well, uh, ixsystems.com slash techsnap. Go check them out. They are awesome. And say hi to them at one of those conferences and then go get that white paper. I think yes, Also, happy. if you missed that, uh, coming up, uh, Chris Moore and I will both be at Texas Linux Fest in August. And uh, both of us will also be at VBSDCon in September. Very good. Um, and and uh, <clears throat> I will be, but Chris won't be at EuroBSDCon in October in Sweden. So if you're in Europe and feeling left out, we're coming over there too. Uh, you know what? Since we're doing the meetup, uh, since we're doing the plugging thing, really quick, let me just plug a couple of meetups that are coming up really soon for the Jupiter Broadcasting <laughs> community. Uh, obviously, I just mentioned Southeast Linux Fest and BSD Can, uh, but uh, learn about open source tech on Saturday, June thirteenth, uh, in uh, in London. Uh, cool. Popey uh, is from uh, Linux Unplugged and mm -hmm. uh, the UK Ubuntu podcast. Uh, is hosting the Open Tech uh, Learn About Open Tech Meetup. It's going to be on Saturday, June thirteenth, uh, at a Student Central uh, uh, Marlin. I think it's Marlet Street in London. And so he's asking to see if people want to meet up with them from the Jupiter Broadcasting community. You go to meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting. If you're in the area and want to do a London meetup, they're going to do one. Meetup.com slash Jupiter Broadcasting to find out more about that. And then. Uh, then, I'm, then I'll, then I'll uh, just so we're, we'll just get all this out of the way so you guys know where we're going to be at and when. Uh, on August seventeenth, I'll be at LinuxCon in Seattle. So if you'd like to come say hi on in August, on August seventeenth, Noah and I will be at LinuxCon in Seattle on August seventeenth. And then OSCON is July twentieth uh, through the twenty fourth, and we'll be there that weekend, probably on a Saturday, uh, in uh, Portland, Oregon, to do uh, to do OSCON. So that's coming up really soon. That's so. Let's see. Uh, July. Let's go look at July on July. Uh, looks like I'll probably be there. See, they're gonna. It's going through the twentieth through the twenty fourth. Oh, so it's during the week. So we'll probably be there. Mm -hmm. We'll probably be there like uh, we'll probably be there like Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday or something. We'll have to be down there. We'll be tell people more. But there's great opportunities to meet up with the crew very soon. Um, Alan, as we talk about IX systems, one thing that always makes me think about is. Intel processors, you know, because they've really built, yep. IX often gets their hands on these processors and builds incredible solutions around them before the other manufacturers even ship their first product. So I guess mm -hmm. that's maybe why when I think of IX, I think of Intel. And we've got a little detail on some up and coming Intel processors, don't we? Yes. Uh, so, you know, we've heard about Broadwell, their new architecture or next generation of uh, processors. Uh, and they've been available for laptops for a while, but they didn't have the desktops until now. Uh, Intel has released the i7-5775C and i5-5765C, uh, which are the new line of desktop processors that are Broadwell. Okay. Uh, because this is, they do a TikTok uh, thing, and this is the talk, so it's the uh, smaller incrementation. But uh, usually that just means you're getting uh, better performance out of kind of the same technology. Uh, so uh, the desktop line actually got slightly delayed. Uh, they had some problems with the new... Uh, with Haswell, they were using 22 nanometer, and uh, with Broadwell, they shrunk to 14 nanometer. Uh, and the, some problems with the process resulted in the entire Broadwell line being delayed slightly, uh, but the desktop ones got delayed even more. Hmm, okay, yeah. But I, the I, two new models are out, uh, and they're both in the 65-watt uh, thermal design power oh envelope, yeah. which is actually the middle end, uh, where normally you would expect their top ones to actually be at the top end. Uh, but these ones apparently can get uh, as good performance as you know a 4770K uh, out of 65 watts instead of taking 88 watts. My body is ready. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. I'm ready. Uh, the Broadwell chips have a lower thermal design power than the top-end Haswells, huh. although they are uh, slightly slower uh, clock speed as well, although they are unlocked, even though they don't have the K 
uh, thing at the end, so they can be overclocked, although uh, no one's actually got around to doing that yet to see oh. how far. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, not yet. But in general, the for clock speed and so on, they look more like the i7 like 4790S than the higher end uh, 4770K. Okay. But with the lower uh, thermal, that's pretty interesting. So overall, the speeds are not quite as fast as the current generation Haswell flagship stuff, the very top end, but they're quite good. One of the big differences, though, is they have the Iris Pro 6200 integrated GPU. Now, in the past, the Iris Pro stuff has only been available on the ones that are like soldered into like a NUC or a, a laptop. They've never been available on the socketed ones before. Yeah. Uh, but their super high-end uh, graphics are now available on a regular i7. Is, so is that like the, is, do you know, is that like the uh, uh, Iris 5500 when they say super high-end or is it, is it not clear? It's an Iris Pro 6200. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Yeah. Uh, so this is the first time that Intel's integrated GPU will actually be faster than AMD's top offering. No. Although although the Intel one's a bit more expensive. We got to see that in the market. Or I got to see more that. Expensive, I think. Uh, they have benchmarks linked in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, so this is, uh, the Intel ones are more expensive, but they do finally, uh, it's the first time that Intel's integrated graphics have outperformed AMD's integrated graphics. Oh, huh, okay. Um, also, they say Broadwell will soon be replaced by Skylake, yeah. which is the next uh, big iteration. Is it and on time, happen, though? Uh, so far on time, okay. it will happen later this year, oh, okay. if scheduled. Uh, so if you're looking at upgrading, you might want to wait a little bit yeah. and go to skip uh, even further it ahead. It seems like Intel kind of blew it here by getting Broadwell so delayed, they've pushed it right up against well, Skylake. Yeah, so actually they uh, you know, they like announced them at the same conference or whatever. It's like, this one's coming out, or it's this one's available now, and this one's coming out soon. It's kind of uh, embarrassing. Yeah. Well, I think it's because it's uh, because of the way their thing worked. It, you know, Sky Lake is already scheduled, and it's like, well, why delay it, right? Um, the other interesting thing Broadwell introduces that I think Sky Lake will have as well is e uh, DRAM, which basically acts like an L4 cache. Mm -hmm. So they actually have like a embedded RAM, so a little bit of RAM that's actually in the CPU. Oh man! Uh, so in the Broadwell ones, that's 128 megabytes of e DRAM. Whoa! Uh, and this basically alleviates memory bandwidth pressure by providing a largish pool of RAM near the CPU yeah. that has lower latency and greater bandwidth than you get actually going out to of the course. RAM on the system. Yeah, of course. Um, looking at the benchmarks, the eDRAM uh, seems to have the greatest effects on graphics. You know, it's it's partly there uh, to provide the RAM for the GPU. Sure, yeah. Uh, and so, because that was one of the biggest things that slowed the embedded GPUs, of course or it is. the integrated GPUs down versus a uh, discrete one is that they had to share the memory out of your main memory, I've which is always, not as fast. I've always suspected that is a major drawback on performance for integrated right. graphics. So basically, they're embedding 128 megabytes of RAM in the processor for the GPU, except for it can be used for other stuff as well. So if you're not using the GPU much, you could actually use it for other stuff. I like that. Um, um, so they said, you know, they saw moderate increases in their non-3D uh, benchmarks as well. In particular, it seems to have advantages for video encoding. Because it lets you keep that much more uh, stuff hot in the cache. I would think CPU. so, right? Because it's doing all of that math. It's, it's, it's looking at all of those frames, and it could stuff all of that in RAM while it's sorting through all of it. Yeah, or even you know, be prefetching some of it. And yeah. So, oh, man. If uh, an encoder could take advantage of it somehow and prefetch like that. Oh. Yeah. Now, I think this is uh, their, their test is obviously running handbrake, so it's like the encoding. Like, but yeah, That's if it could last time night. off your WebM. Yeah, <laughs> if you could shave time off your WebM encode, it would make you a happy person. I actually right? have for the last couple of weeks been using. Uh, we record, we encode two different versions of Unfilter: one for our supporters, and you know, mm -hmm. one for everybody else. And the, the supporters one is getting encoded right now with Handbrake. It's just a really good encoder. Uh, so the fact that they're testing and, with that—that's uh, one of the, that's one of the benchmarks they use—is encoding a low quality and a high quality Love video it. with uh, yeah with Handbrake. Uh, and so that right. you know, you'd definitely be interested in that part of the benchmark. I like their benchmarking with the tools that I was using. <laughs> Exactly. Well, it tells you that's that's what makes it a useful benchmark, right? It's it's yeah. the workload you're actually interested in. Yeah. Uh, and then the last interesting thing is just that uh, it's a bit unexpected for the desktop range to only have two processors. Although oh, we've sure, ever sure. seen uh, Intel reducing the number of separate part numbers they have. Uh, like we saw that with the latest generation of Xeons as well. They went from like twelve to six or something like that, uh, which is probably better. As you know. In the end, but uh, the interesting thing here is that uh, unlike traditionally, we're not seeing a low power version of the Broadwell for desktop. There's no 35 watt processor, ah. or even higher end, there's no 88 watt processor. 
And I think it might just be because it was so delayed. They're just like, yeah, a couple. Yeah. So we have something yeah. to last till Skylight. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I think that's exactly what they're doing. And that, that does make sense. And, and OEMs can build some products around these processors. They're right. solid releases. And so uh, Well, because the interesting thing is uh, Intel had the chipset, right, that the Z97 or whatever out, and people have been using them with Haswell chips just because there was no Broadwell, but it was supposed to come with it, right? Uh, and so... What do yeah, you think, it, though? Everything's all out of lockstep there, and that's the uh, first time it's happened. It's so, kind of weird. Alan, you've now got um, you've got the uh, you know obviously you've got multiple CPUs, different types of controllers. You've got RAM. You've got the GPU. Uh, more and more things, like even parts of the Northbridge, are getting integrated into the CPU, and pretty soon, yeah. Intel CPUs are going to be an entire system on a chip. Almost. Uh, yeah, because they definitely have integrated the memory controller. But doesn't that hurt competition in the market? Stuff. Doesn't that hurt graphics manufacturers and motherboard manufacturers and RAM manufacturers? Well, if you're really worried about uh, graphics, you're probably going to have the, the, a, a separate discrete CPU or GPU. The interesting thing is uh, we'll be seeing, you know, I liked it when Intel offered versions of like i7 with and without the GPU. Yeah. So that, you know, if I'm going to... I uh, have my own graphics card. I'm not paying for a little one to be embedded in the CPU. Yeah. But at the same time, if that little one embedded in the CPU can do a really good job of encoding video, maybe I don't mind so much. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I honestly don't mind it either. It's but also, you know, can I get a version of the i7 with the embedded DRAM from the graphics thing, but without the graphics card or turn the graphics card off or something so that all of that RAM is never used for the graphics? Well, the fact of the matter is, though, uh, you know, for most consumers, I would be willing to bet that Intel 6200 graphics is going to be good enough for a year or so after you buy a machine because the 5500 is getting pretty good. So the 6200 has got to be... So it's definitely nice to see the Iris Pro versions rather yeah. than just the uh, Media Accelerator or whatever and they call it. What I like about it is you could run off of that 6200 graphics for a while and then down the road, six months, a year down the road, you throw in a dedicated GPU. So there is some advantages to that as well. It's, it kind of gives you a nice price starting point. Uh, Steam machines are going to take advantage of this as well, right? Steam machines, a lot of them are going to ship with Intel graphics and then users can slot in graphics later on. Yep. Uh, Azer in the chat room asks if there's no, going to be no unlocked SKU. The only SKU they have is actually unlocked. The 4775C okay. well, or 5775C is unlocked. Uh, so that was also interesting to see that they only have the one SKU, but it is unlocked. Hmm. Hmm. Can't wait. I want and now you're already making me have a new machine envy. Like I'm always good, yeah. and then you start talking about these Intel processors, and oh but man, I, I, you know, you might want to wait for the Skylight. I think so. I think I will tell myself that. You know, I, I, I have a top end Hasbro, and I don't really. I know, right? Much. I know. Alan, uh, I don't know if you heard the rumor on the street, but uh, there's a brand new episode of BSD now out. Did you know that? I've known that since before we started. Oh, you probably did, huh? Yeah, that would make yeah. sense since uh, you co-hosted with Chris Moore. You'd probably be kind well, of Well, also, in. mostly because Rakai told me. So, BSD episode, BSD now episode 92, BSD after midnight. <laughs> really? Bow, chicka, wow, wow. Uh, check it out. Uh, this is the ha the halfway point in the Taxinet program. So, if you want to go grab the HD version of BSD now and get a little more Alan Jude in your face, you can. Episode 92 of the BSD now program is out. But with the news all done, that means it's time for the TechSnap feedback. Thanks for sending your emails to techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com or popping that contact link at the top of the Jupiter Broadcasting site or, like a ninja, submitting a thread to our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. Sensen writes in with our first email this week. Mm -hmm. Hello, Chris and Alan, he says, in your recent shows, you talked a lot about security systems and how the warning should be reduced to a minimum to avoid noise and sysadmins ignoring them. FreeNAS sends me some warning emails now and then that I have no idea what they mean. Most of the time, they seem like random level kernel log dumps, which have nothing to do with security. Only some of them have failed logins added at the end. Can you tell me if any of these are important and what do they mean? And he gives us a couple of examples. Like one in here is uh, like a, a reply address mismatch error. Another one is a failed to yeah, set so, watchdog error. Uh, uh, well, that one's a set from IPMI, which is the uh, remote management interface. Yeah. Um, a bunch of errors there usually means something's going wrong there. Or could it mean uh, that he doesn't have IPMI, but the system thinks he nope. does? Okay. Uh, no, that's it. Would the Just module wouldn't load if you don't have it? Okay. Um, so if your IPMI is, IPMI is exposed to the internet, that one kind of suggests that it's being brute forced so hard that it's actually hung itself. <laughs> uh, and 
Yeah, so that one actually might mean something. You want to look into it. The I don't know what context these emails are being sent in and, and where Freenas is getting the information from. The example two, the first couple lines are the regular like boot messages. Like it there's talking about the uh, the real time clock and then mounting root from his USB device. Yeah. And then it's got the MAC addresses yeah. of the e pair devices, which is uh, the way the jails on his Freenas get internet. What'd you make of that? Yeah, that one's a little weird. The last one, though, the ARP message about a Mac, uh, uh, an IP address moving from one MAC address to another suggests that either there's an IP conflict uh, or the, that IP address would move from one machine to another. Uh, and so that usually does mean something, although it's not usually something to be that worried about. Okay. Usually the only time I see that one is if you have redundant routers and an IP address is moving between them or something, or oh. if you physically move an IP address from one machine to another. That would make sense. Uh, it's yeah. warning there because it can also be evidence of like ARP spoofing, but I wouldn't expect that in this case because it's not your default gateway or anything. Okay. Um, I'm not sure which emails he's getting exactly or what they're like. I'm not that familiar with FreeNAS, honestly. But um, the IPMI one is something you probably might want to care about. You install IPMI tool and reset the IPMI so you can access it if you need it. The other, the example two, uh, that's none of that is useful. All right, all right. So your advice to him is? I have no idea. I don't that familiar yeah. with FreeNAS. I guess. Uh, so you, but uh, well, actually, Alan, I think that's actually kind of a good er, a good sign. That means it's probably not something systemic to the operating system, but something unique in the FreeNAS config, which probably means it's not but, detrimental. But there, there is there is an option in FreeBSD to get emailed a giant chunk of the log every morning, uh, and yeah. You can look at those. I like where his head's uh, at, though. I like reducing uh, spam and error messages. I think that's a good call. Yep. Uh, exactly. If you can tune these down so they only get an email when there's actually something you want to look at, yeah. then you won't just ignore them. You know, For a while, when I had my server set up and they were sending that daily email every day, they just got sorted to a folder so that if something went wrong, I could go back and look at them, but they didn't really trigger me noticing when something was wrong. Yeah, that's yeah. what happens. Yes, exactly. Uh, all right. Well, let's stay on the free NAS train this week. Uh, we're gonna get a couple. We're gonna get another free NAS question in here, and then I'll wrap up our free NAS for today. Sandro writes in with an iSCSI free NAS question. Having heard so much about IX systems in your show, I ended up ordering a free NAS mini with the full extras: 24 terabyte wet, uh, rest and digital reds, 32 gigabytes of RAM, L2 ARC. Wow. Look at this. He also has a ZIL's SSD for my team. The goal mm -hmm. is to use it to host our tests and development VMs from three ESX hosts since the 6-terabyte RAID 6 local storage in our main ESX server is now 85% used. Unlike, mm -hmm. our listener, unlike our listener who set up his free NAS as an iSCSI device, I decided to mount it as an NFS volume so that all ESX hosts can see the same disk volume. You know, that also allows vMotion to uh, move things around in the future a little easier. Initial benchmarks, though, show terrible, terrible performance. I'm talking 30, 13 megabytes per second. 13 megabytes per second when copying files from ESX to the ZFS volume. Copying from my laptop to ZFS, I could do 112 megabytes a second. So I knew that something with something was wrong. I tried plugging in the ESX NIC directly uh, to the free NAS rig, so no switch was in between, and played with jumbo frame configurations, but nothing seemed to improve it. Many hours of Googling, I found the reason to be that ESX only supports synchronous NFS mounts. The solution I found was to disable sync rights for that specific volume on the free NAS. And he includes the uh, pseudo ZFS set sync equals disabled uh, tank VMs for his set. Uh, my, this solution breaks all the rules that ZFS experts recommend, but it's the only one that works for me. He says, by the way, no UPS system, async rights, and the cherry on the top is he has ZFS dedupe. How is everyone else using ZFS with ESX then? What do you think, Alan? I was under the impression there was a way to force ESX to not set the sync flag on NFS. Um, but also, uh, the Zill should be helping with it a isn't lot. That with the, uh, Zudo, isn't that what the pseudo ZFS set sync equals disabled command does? There is No, that, that one's telling ZFS that when NFS asks you not to return until the write's all the way done in ZFS, just lie and say it was done even though it's not. Uh, and then so ZFS, as soon as ZFS has got the change in memory... It tells the um, the ESX that it's got it all written, yeah. and the ESX is ready to do the next thing. Because basically, with with Syncritus, what you're saying is every time that uh, ESX wants to write a block to the disk, it sends the write, and it doesn't send the next one until that one says it's finished. Okay. So that if the power goes out or something, it knows exactly how far, how much of the data got actually saved. Whereas with um, uh, when you set sync disabled. It'll, you'll just keep sending them as fast as you can. Mm -hmm. Well, almost, right? Because 
uh, ESX is still going to wait for the latency of the LAN for each write. Whereas if you can actually disable sync on the ESX side, then you can actually have it send it faster. Uh, and then on the ZFS side, you can actually combine them into bigger writes and be okay uh, when you do your... And you won't have to set sync disabled in ZFS. Ah, good tip. Um, but, um, yeah, with the ESX, I don't know exactly what you can do to, to get ESX to not do synchronous NFS mounts. Uh, but setting the sync disabled on ZFS, the worst case there is you could lose the up to the last five seconds uh, since the last ZFS actual sync um, if the power goes out. And, you know, the f last five seconds isn't so bad, especially in the case where hmm, the yeah. data is going to be consistent and not all screwed up. Yeah. All right. Alan, uh, speaking of uh, ZFS, weird as it is, uh, Anders writes in with a question. He says, hey, guys. Thanks for the awesome show. Here's my contribution to the usual weekly pile of ZFS questions. He says, sorry, nothing related to PF. That's okay. We, we saved the PF ones. Uh, I've put together an HP microserver running FreeBSD 10.1 currently with two 2 terabyte Western Digital Reds for storage in a mirror, a total 2 terabyte storage. I would like to extend the total storage to 4 terabytes whilst maintaining redundancy, so I need to buy at least one more drive. My options are, please clerk me if I'm wrong, buying two more disks, setting up a mirrored stripe VDEV with a mirror of two 2 terabytes in a stripe, totaling four 2 terabyte disks, buying one more disk and doing a 4 terabyte red Z1, buying two more disks and doing a 4 terabyte red Z2. Red Z1 is obviously the cheapest, but I only get the redundancy of a parity drive. Question is, if I go with red Z1 now, can I extend it with one parity drive later without having to rebuild and reformat the whole drive? Also, could you please explain the difference between options one and three from a volume management perspective? What actually happens under the hood in RAID Z2 and what, uh, what is so different to it than just simple mirroring? Best and greetings from Australia. Right. So with option one is probably your best option because having the two separate VDEVs means you're going to get more performance. Uh, option three is the more secure option. Um, and to answer your previous question about can I upgrade a RAID Z1 to a RAID Z2, no. Although you can be tricky and create it as a RAID Z2 with the fourth drive actually not being there and they just leave it offline until you get one. But then, So it's effectively a RAID Z1 the whole time uh -huh. until you add the second drive, but that's kind of complicated. Um, so the big uh, to explain the difference between doing the two sets of mirrors across your four drives versus doing all four as one RAID Z2. The big difference is if you're doing uh, two, mirror, uh, two sets of mirrors, if both drives and one mirror die, you lose everything. With RAID Z2, if any two drives die, you're fine. Uh, but the cost is slightly more performance. So the big difference is with, uh, with the mirrors, you have the two disks working in sync. So whenever you write to one of the two disks, it writes to the second one, and then you have the other one. So if one of them gets slowed down a little bit or something, uh, or is busy reading or something, uh, it'll let the other one keep going. Whereas in RAID Z, because they're all working together, you have to wait until they're all ready. Uh, so the mirrors will give you slightly better speed. Uh, the RAID Z will give you more security. Because uh, you know, with the mirrors, you could lose two disks at a time without dying, mm. as long as they were the right two disks. Yeah. With RAID Z2, <laughs> you can be any two disks. Okay. Uh, the other advantage to the mirrors is if you want to do it again and add two more drives, it's easy to do. With the RAID Z, the, you, t you basically, if your RAID Z is consisting of four drives, then if you want to add more, you need four more drives to make a whole second RAID Z. Uh, so mirrors definitely give you that more flexibility, but they're not quite as safe as the RAID Z. So it's really up to you. And, you know, if you're in the HP microserver and it's only got room for four hard drives, then the ability to add the, the hard drive five and six is less of a consideration, right? So okay. I, I'd go with one or three. Uh, or yeah. that crazy hack I talked about to basically make a RAID Z3 with only three of the hard drives. Use um, G0, I think it's called, yeah. uh, to simulate the fourth drive just while you're labeling it and then immediately offline it and then just write your data to it. Oh, okay. And then eventually you can do uh, zpool replace the phantom drive with an actual real one. Uh, but, you know, yeah. that's definitely not a supported configuration. Yeah, yeah. But it would basically simulate a RAID Z1 that was later upgradable to a RAID Z2. 
Which is what he's looking for. If, yeah. Uh, the advantage with the advantage of doing four drives with RAID Z1 would be that you would actually get six terabytes of usable space instead of four. Yeah. Uh, but you'd only be able to lose one drive. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, That's a so great yeah. breakdown, Alan. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, now, we have even more questions. We're recording a double episode today, so if you uh, send an email into the show and you didn't see it, uh, don't worry. We're going to do a whole other batch in uh, just a couple of minutes, and that'll be in next week's episode of the TechSnap program. That will bring us roughly to inbox zero, though, so we'd love to get your questions. Go over to jupiterbroadcasting.com, click the contact link, and choose TechSnap from the dropdown. You can also email us directly, techsnap at jupiterbroadcasting.com, or I've mentioned it before, that's subreddit techsnap.reddit.com but Alan with the emails all done that means it's time for the TechSnap Roundup Welcome to the TechSnap Roundup. Yeah, that's what that crazy music means. Now, the roundup for stories that just didn't fit at the top of the show, but we still want to give you some links to follow up on on your own after the show. And a lot of these links came from our subreddit over at techsnap.reddit.com. Our first story today is for any of you who are PayPal users. You might need to know about a terms of service change that's coming up soon. As I I believe beginning July 1st, PayPal becomes their own separate entity from eBay. And as part of that, a new user agreement is taking effect. And the fine print says that PayPal is a law is allowed to robocall you, regardless if you're on an, on, a, on like a government do not call, do not disturb type list. Additionally, on top of that, they can robo text you, and on top of that, anybody that PayPal deems to be an affiliate, which seems to be at a loose definition for PayPal, is allowed to do these things. And the best part is, say you want to take advantage of the Consumer Protection Act, which created the do not call list or the Fair Debt Collections Practices Act, which bans most robocalling and texting. Say you want to take advantage of one of these acts in the U.S. to stop this. PayPal's recourse, when you call up to cancel it, is they forward you to the cancelization department so you can cancel your PayPal account. Mm. Um, the the do, not, do not call list in Canada already has a loophole for this. If you have an active account with the company, they're allowed to call you, uh, you know, because you're actually doing business with them so it's i guess i don't know if the u.s one is less specific or something but um i can understand how their justification would be like well we need the right to text you so that we can you know notify you every time you get a payment or whatever if you want but at the same time yeah it seems like they're doing this to try to abuse you or sell you their credit card or who knows what they're actually doing yeah and it seems like if that if the intention is to give you controls over your account and to give you warnings about account issues uh, then you don't need the language in there for affiliates, and you don't need the language well, in the there. The affiliates one is really dirty. Yeah, and you don't need the language in there either that says uh, we will disregard the list. Because in my opinion, my view of it is, if I've signed up for a do not disturb list, I am taking an active set. I am ta- I'm doing something actively to say I don't want this. I'm making a choice, making my intention very overt and very obvious. I'm actively putting myself on this list. And the, the problem is for me is I, 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 nowhere in, in, in my daily schedule is it very convenient for me to take calls. I'm on mm-hmm. air a lot. And so I've reduced my phone usage considerably because of that. And so when my phone rings, it's generally pretty important. And so I keep it next to me. And I don't want that phone ringing with some sort of PayPal advertisement on there. I've already had a yeah. problem with PayPal calling me, trying to get me to sign up for a line of credit before, and, it, and they were calling me nonstop every single day. Um, well, so I've already had problems problem with that, this. You know, when calls like that, they outsource to some company who can then you know, be overzealous and so on because they get paid for how many people convert. Uh, and then PayPal was like, well, it's not our fault. We didn't tell them to do yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think in the meantime, I, my, my advice to the listeners out there is, you know, keep an eye on PayPal for a while. And keep an eye on the competitors, too, because 2016 and 2015 are going to be a pretty competitive year for online payments. I mean, look at Stripe well, yes, and I Bitcoin. Think, uh, and- well, yeah, Stripe, Bitcoin, and Apple Pay and so on. Uh, PayPal's definitely feeling threatened, and it definitely seems like telemarketing people is definitely the wrong way to go. Yeah. So hopefully just... You want to be the new guy. You want to feel... You, you got to yeah. be hip-ish. Maybe a little it, consumer it, it, pressure it, because of that will keep them in line on this. Um, and you also got Google working on payment solutions. And you know Facebook's working on it as well. So... And there's even... You can even send payments through Gmail now. So PayPal's really got to compete. Hey, uh, I yep. didn't get a chance to digest this next roundup story fully. Uh, hence the reason it's in the roundup. But this is a great study of basically how buggy the firmwares are on SSDs over a whole bunch of SSDs for the last five years. Yeah, so this guy's got a bunch of SSDs been running for quite a while, 
and uh, he gives us a rundown on how all the different SSDs have actually performed. Big yeah. spoiler alert is SSD firmware is buggy and so on. Yes. Uh, first one, Intel is actually not bad. <laughs> Intel has been great. We've been using it for four years, and they're great. And, you know, everybody else I talk to has the same. Intel SSDs are very good. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, OCZ on the other side, you know, uh, outside of the 160 gigabyte Intel drives, our search, our solar stack was the first to benefit from denser, faster storage. Search indexes were getting too big uh, to fit in memory, so we put them on an SSD uh, rather than an expensive, uh, fast but low capacity spinning rust uh, or something. We opted for the OCZ Talos 960 gig disks. They weren't too bad, uh, but we had a spat of initial failures <laughs> that seemed like uh, just a bad batch. And we were uh, able to learn from this to make the apps more uh, resilient to various failures. Sure. Uh, they also say, however, they had very poor smart information, basically none. So predicting failures or checking the wear leveling and so on was basically impossible. Mm. And then later the company went bankrupt. So it yeah. really, yeah. Yeah, yeah, not the greatest drugs. No. Although, uh, Toshiba has uh, rescued them from the dead, uh, but it's you know, you know, they were unavailable for long enough. They're not really. They don't have any that have been around long enough uh, of the Toshiba-ish right. uh, OCZ drives to report there. Then they tried the HP SSDs, which are actually just uh, third-party SSDs branded by HP. So when you buy them, you never know which one you're going to get. <laughs> uh, you know, they said in overall they seem pretty good. Uh, but HP's proprietary RAID controllers don't support smart passwords or drives, so they refuse to give you any of the smart data that might be on your SSDs. Also, if you slot an unsupported disk or SSD into the controller, you have no idea how the drive is performing or failing because you're not getting the smart data. They said they quickly learned after running for a while that these boxes that performance randomly tanked. The SSDs underlying the RAID seemed to be dying and slowing down, and we had no, of no, no way of knowing which one or ones were the problem or how to fix it. Uh, uh, presumably, the drives were not being issued the trims commands properly because the RAID controller didn't support that, and so uh, that's why they would slow down because they wouldn't know which mm. data they could garbage collect uh, safely. Oh, interesting. Okay. Uh, so this, when they had to purchase a new box for their primary database, uh, we're left with no choice. They had to pay HP for their uh, certified SSDs. Mm. That uh, 960 gig SSDs direct from HP, properly supported, cost seven thousand dollars each. Oh, and to buy four of them to build their storage array. It's like you guys should have called IX. Yeah. Uh, they said on the upside, they do have fancy detailed stats like wear leveling and and lifetime remaining and so on. Gives you peace of mind. the controller and their ILO. I like that. Uh, none have failed yet in almost three years, and they're still showing 99% healthy, which makes me slightly suspect that the health data might not be perfect. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, they say Samsung saved the day by picking up for OCZ with, uh, you know, Ludicrous, yeah. ludicrously cheap 960 gigabyte yeah. uh, SSDs with the 840 Evo, a consumer drive, uh, so it has a very limited warranty, but the price of only four or $500 for uh, practically a terabyte gets uh, quite a few IOPS and are quite reliable. They had uh, better smart info and seemed to play nicely with their hardware, so they bought a lot of those. Hmm. Uh, they have 117 hosts that have uh, the six each of those uh, Samsung drives. Wow. And that doesn't include the hosts that are behind, where it's behind a RAID controller, and so the Samsung name doesn't actually show up in their in the search they did of their Chef database. Hmm. That's good. And That's then good. they say the uh, BB6Q happened. <laughs> uh, there's a certain type of SSDs. For, uh, so buying SSDs from OEMs is still expensive, and they give you those fancy enterprise level drives right and redundancy at the app level right yeah. we don't need that so they started buying uh, Dell's with the uh, Dell's rebranded LSI RAID controller and they happily uh, talked the drives including full smart info and they had 16 Samsung drives behind a Dell controller which gave them 7.3 terabytes at full speed and uh, you know those were already proven so they were quite happy and they ordered the same spec box with the uh, Ganglia hardware refresh from Dell and they didn't work. Uh, apparently, the RAID controller hung on startup trying to initialize the drives uh, so long that the boot ROM was never loaded and it was impossible to boot from the array created using them. Jeez. Uh, so then they played with some stuff and uh, looked at how to deal with that. 
Mr. Jude. Uh, they talked about uh, quite a few other ones there, so I recommend uh, taking a look I'm at it. I'm taking away is the Samsungs are surprising champions uh, in their in their <clears> tests here for price performance. Yeah. Although they, yeah. you know, if you're serious, the obviously the Intel enterprise grade ones are the the gold standard at the moment. But yeah, yeah of course. Uh, yeah, Seagate has. Uh, like higher end, like the Evo Pros, that might even be kind of a good middle mm. ground. I know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, a bunch of the boxes of the FreeBSD Foundation use those. Now uh, we have a uh, post in here uh, that just went up on the first of June, so it's pretty fresh on uh, the Facebook blog about mm-hmm. securing email communications from Facebook. Kind yes. of going in with our Remember first story. Remember how we just talked yeah. about, you know, if your password reset email coming from Facebook could be unencrypted, and then somebody could spy on it. Indeed. Well, uh, also, you know. Say you're worried about mm, Gmail reading all the emails you get from Facebook and learning too much information about you. You're fine with Facebook knowing, but not with Google. I, I don't know. But anyway. <laughs> uh, so Facebook, uh, or maybe it's your ISP you're worried about. Maybe. Who knows? Anyway, so uh, Facebook announces that you can now give them your GPG or PGP public key, and they will encrypt all the emails they send you uh, so that only you can read them. I like that. Yes. Separately, so you don't have to use that feature. You can use just this other one. You can also publish your PGP key on your profile page so that it's a good way to link. I a, really like that. that. This email address is actually this Facebook uh, person and the other way around. That's legit. Uh, or people can easily find your key to connect you. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of, uh, what was that other one? Um, Keybase? Keybase, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking. Uh, that. I think one of the only things Keybase doesn't support is Facebook, right? They they have your Twitter, your GitHub, your Hacker News, a bunch of other ones, but they didn't uh, mention Facebook. Sounds like an acquisition. Has their own things. Huh? Very good, Alan. Good find, man. Good find. I I heard, I saw the headline, didn't read it. I love it when you catch that kind of stuff. Well, uh, the based on that, in, I don't think PGP encrypts the the subject line, which with Facebook could probably leak quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, all destination too. Um, <clears throat> All right, CBC News has a story about fake answers for online security questions making those security questions less secure, which we've sometimes yeah. advocated in, in some sense. Well, we've talked about that before, but um, if you don't, like we, when we've advocated, the idea was don't forget just a long random string and start in your last pass. Yeah. Although that can be difficult if you have to answer it over the phone or something. But um, the problem with, you know, if, if it asks what's your dad's middle name or something and, and you just wrote screw off or something that's actually fairly predictable <laughs> and and yeah if you use something too predictable for your fake answer that might be easier to guess than your dad's actual middle name hmm. yeah I so suppose especially if you knew the person's answer, personality to be, too right well no it's more just people there's a, a small subset of common things people are likely to type as a fake answer right yeah that makes sense. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, putting Typical humans. Uh, but yes, the hardest part, obviously, of putting fake answers for anything is making sure you keep it straight. You know, five years from now, you're going to remember what fake answer you put for that question on that one site. <laughs> uh, and, you know, is the fake answer that secure if you're using it everywhere and a bunch of other things. But right. in the end, uh, last pass seems to be. Mm-hmm. Or something of that ilk, like key pass or whatever. Mm-hmm. Hey, this I do like the idea of, of key pass or something where you're self-hosting instead of having to give it to LastPass, but yeah. I'm using LastPass in the moment. So. This yeah. next story seems like maybe some good news, maybe a good trend. Server sales have been boosted, they say, by the cloud, nonetheless. Server right, vendors right, are... Yeah, so we, we've talked about, you know, oh, everything moving to the cloud is causing there to be fewer new PC sales. Right. And, and fewer, On-premise you server know, sales are going people, down. Yeah, but basically people are buying less computers because everything they're storing stuff in the cloud. But... All it's really doing is causing people to buy more servers to run the cloud. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, in general, I think the amount of PC sales isn't really down. It's just shifted from yeah. people refreshing their desktops as often. Uh, and I don't think it's so much to do with the cloud. I think it's just desktops now got fast enough where mm-hmm. even if I have a five generation old i5, mm-hmm. that's still fast enough to do pretty much anything. Yeah. HP even high end gaming and stuff. HP and Dell looks like most of their revenue is coming uh, to, on strong demand for its rack optimized servers. Density yep. optimized server businesses, while, uh, while small overall, are, uh, are experiencing triple digit revenue growth year over year, according to IDC right now. Mm-hmm. Huh. How about that? Dell increased uh, right. revenue and shipments, but it wasn't quite able to keep up with the market. Its share of revenue shipments slipped by just under 1%. So really, just HP is mostly up. Dell's up, but they're still slipping. Yeah. Um, 
and there's other ones, but uh, you know, I'd expect both of them to slip more in places like IX to take off because they have better solutions to a lot of the stuff. So, uh, uh, and then, the, but the interesting one is at yeah. BSD Can, they're going to be presenting one from NEC uh, in Japan, where they have a machine where if you fill the rack with them, you would get five thousand cores in one rack. Whoa! Uh, That's going to be each, at BSD Can. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I've actually got to physically touch one uh, in Japan. Ooh. I had one. Uh, so it's, I think it was two or three U's. I think it was two U's. And it had 40 some odd uh, eight core atoms in it. Ooh. Each one like, it looked like, basically each looked like a little video card all right. snapped into slots. All right. And then there were also slots where you stick in more SSDs. But each little uh, card had uh, two sticks of RAM, an M SATA, the processor, and you know all the bits you basically would need, right? RAM, CPU, and disk. And then when they slotted in, they had two uh, 2.5 gigabit per second uh, Ethernet ports that went into the main controller thing. And then that box had I think two 40 gigabit ports that went out to the network. And then you would just fill a rack with these. And they're like, yes, they're slightly slower than you know a, a Xeon, but you can fit this many Xeons in a rack, and you can fit this many more of these atoms in a rack. And in total, you would be able to do more work with those, depending on your workload being, you know, able to be spread out over more smaller cores on separate machines. But uh, the biggest, the big reason they're coming to BSD can is because they've been quite a bit of work to to make some uh, FreeBSD will be like a their recommended platform for it. Hmm. Alan, this next uh, piece has me rather fascinated. It's up on the uh, Red Hat uh, uh, blog. And it's called uh, Why I Wrote the Open Organization, a book called The Open Organization, created by this author, is about creating successful businesses in today's enormously fast-moving technology climate. He says the only way to do that is by eschewing the old ways of doing business and including top-down, hierarchical approach. Getting rid of that in favor of a new approach that emphasizes soliciting and embracing everyone's opinions and letting go of commanding control and moving away from traditional management comfort zones. Yeah, so this is uh, a book by the CEO of Red Hat on how they successfully built a business by embracing open source and and the whole idea of taking ideas that come from just people in the community and so on instead of, you know, if it if it didn't come from my CIO, it's not a good idea. Hmm. I, wait, maybe I should write a book about Jupiter Broadcasting then because <laughs> I'm taking ideas from a chat room. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, to, how to get other people to make money for you. Yeah, right. Gosh, that, now that's a book I yeah, wouldn't mind see, reading. See, the problem is you're not making any money. I know. That's a book I could read. Uh, all right. So uh, that's, now we move to Network World. Ransomware creator apologizes for the sleeper attack. I didn't mean to, guys. Here's the decryption keys. My bad. Not so much I didn't mean to. Uh, but yeah, so this guy wrote uh, one of those crypto locker type things, except yeah. for this one, infected a bunch of machines and then waited. And then on a certain date, flipped on and encrypted all your files hmm. so that uh, it would be able to spread more before it got Before anybody anybody noticed. It. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then he went on Pastebin and posted uh, a note saying he was sorry about it and posting the stuff to let everybody decrypt their files. He felt bad. Now, uh, he's not doing refunds to any of the people that paid the $25 to get their files decrypted. But uh, anybody who hadn't, uh, he posted a link. Now, uh, the antivirus vendor said, we did a quick look and it didn't look like a virus and it definitely you know, contained a bunch of encryption keys and stuff, but you might want to wait until we've had time to analyze it more before you just download the random thing the guy that infected your PC linked to telling you it'll disinfect your PC. Right. Um, hmm. They also say that uh, they speculate that his motive for saying he was sorry and releasing the decryption keys might be... Uh, uh, law enforcement closing in on him, or uh, Eastern European organized cybercrime syndicates being unhappy with him horning in in their market. Uh, most times when we've seen crypto locker type things, they've been a lot more expensive than $25. So I can see the uh, organized crime guys being like, hey, you can't just drive the price down on this. <laughs> you better piss off. Well, Alan, it could be worse. You could have an iPhone that's crashing on you because of a text message bug. Uh, an iOS bu bug lets anyone crash your iPhone with a simple text message. The glitch causes iOS, oh, a glitch, causes iOS to choke when certain non-Latin script is sent in a text message. Causing yeah, the device so if you send like a Chinese character, yeah. it the, will crash yeah. the phone. And then every time they try to open their text message app, it'll just crash again. Yeah, it says here the system and attempts to abbreviate no the text to with an ellipsis. <laughs> if the ellipsis is placed in the middle of a set of non-Latin script characters, including Arabic or, or uh, Chinese, it causes the system to crash and reboot. <laughs> Did you hear right, about... So um, 
uh, in those fancy characters, because ASCII can only do 256 separate characters, that's not enough to do all the Chinese stuff. Right. Uh, you have uh, Unicode, which basically says if the first character is this special character, then there's actually a second character after it, or sometimes even more, uh, that will describe the number you need to draw the bigger character. Well, because their ellipsis thing isn't counting on that, it's breaking one right in the middle. And that's causing it to crash because you're then doing an invalid code. Uh, and yeah, uh, the funny part is we've, there was a bug like this like a year ago uh, and they fixed it. But yeah. This is just a different yeah, one. Yeah. Did it, you hear about the Skype bug? I think before it was like almost anyone. And then uh, this one is like just because of the way they truncated the uh, subject line. Skype had, no, to, uh, Skype? Skype had to patch this week because if you typed HTTP colon slash slash colon and sent that, Skype would crash, and then it would crash every time you reopen Skype. You tried to, because it would try to open up the history and yeah. re-render. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So they, but Microsoft, to their credit, pushed out a quick patch, and we did a little experimentation on Tech Talk Live. We found out that uh, it didn't happen on the Android client, but it could. You could replicate it on both the, the Windows desktop client and on the iOS Skype client. It also would crash with that, which at the time they didn't have a patch out for. Uh, Alan, uh, now I know a few people in uh, my immediate circle who are going to get super upset if you mess with their couponing. So what's this next story about? Uh, fake coupons. So there's a, a website out there in the dark net that was uh, selling counterfeit coupons to allow you to get, you know, ridiculous amounts off and stuff. Uh, you know, stores often uh, don't really consider if somebody might have made up a fake coupon that yeah. offers a higher percent off than yeah. they're supposed to or whatever. Yeah, that seems like that could happen all the time, though. Yeah. Uh, well, apparently they were making millions of dollars off this, and the feds uh, busted one of the big websites that was doing it. There you go. There you go. And uh, get a nice uh, get a nice mention of the dark web in there, and you're set. Yep. Uh, now here yeah. you go. Uh, Wired has a full story on that one. Uh, the Intercept's got a great piece on hacking on a hacked emails that revel- revealed that the Russians were planning to obtain sensitive Western fancy schmancy technology. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, they were after the uh, military grade thermal imaging stuff, uh, and. It's like, well, yes, that's how espionage works. Yeah, right, yeah. Well, there you go. I'm sure the Chinese are after it as well. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much anybody else that cares about military technology is also trying to, you know, I imagine other U.S. companies would like to steal it from the U.S. company that has it. Yeah, Putin want. We all want it, don't we? Uh, All right, how about this one, Alan? Uh, This is uh, a a post, it's a course syllabus, and this has got me thinking, it's time to learn. uh, The the name... uh, uh, so when I first Sex saw the name, it was, uh, it was uh, software exploitation via hardware exploitation. I was like, okay. And then the domain is sexviahex.com. I was like, that is funny. <laughs> All right, that's a good find. That, that, and that's the whole yeah. reason it's in here? Uh, mostly. Well, no, it's actually okay. Uh, okay. interesting, like, just looking at the syllabus and stuff. It's a yeah. four-day course they're offering in a couple yeah. of places. But I think it'll be at DEF CON, except for the DEF CON one's already sold out. But uh, just the fact that it's about learning to hack software by actually hacking the hardware. So, you know, instead of trying to modify the software or something, you just cause the hardware to do unexpected things mm-hmm. and, and let you do stuff with the software you weren't supposed to and so on. Hmm. It's cool. just a, an interesting approach to hacking hardware, by, or actually hacking software by going at the hardware. Now, uh, <clears throat> if you could give me a moment, I would like to set up a presentation here, and I would like to conduct a presentation on uh, why PowerPoint needs to die. Or actually, maybe this post in the Roundup could do it for me. PowerPoint should be banned. Now, Alan, you give plenty of talks. Do you agree? Yep. Um, it's, it's not so much, it doesn't matter what, like, uh, most of the talks I give, nobody uses using PowerPoint, although they're using very similar tools. <laughs> uh, it's really, yeah, this one's more about the style of it. You know, it's like people that just only use PowerPoint and so on. Oh, it's uh, so monotonous. But yeah, um, and then you see, like, you, you've seen really good talks where the slides only have a couple of bullet points and they're big and it's useful. But it's like, if I go and download the slides later, it's missing too much information for the slides to be useful. And it's really finding that right balance of having enough information on the slides. Look at this. But not just standing there reading the slides as your presentation. This is, well. they're using the NSA PRISM slides as an example of really poorly designed slides. Yes. They, the, those PRISM ones. They just make you know that, oh, this is such government bureaucratic The Afghan bullshit. strategy slide, another example of a really bad slide. <laughs> this is great. Uh, people, if you give out presentations and you're doing this and you don't think you're an offender, then you're the problem and you need to go read this article. That's just the math yeah. of it right there. That's the math of it. Okay, Alan, let's talk about the next story moving There's right like, on. Uh, 
George Neville Neal was talking about uh, somebody commented on a joke he made in one of his talks recently and he was like yes when I'm giving a talk it's basically stand up comedy for nerds otherwise I lose everybody's attention yeah it's true you gotta keep them occupied yep. now let's talk about writing some good I'm just not scripts. very good at being funny oh you're funny in your own way in your not, own way not not giving a talk funny though no okay. I'm just not as good as some of those just guys. keep saying yeah. a boot and ZFS and you'll you'll you'll, you'll, you'll please the crowd <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll I, notice at BSD camp. <laughs> oh, that's true. Your advantage is lost there, I suppose. Uh, yeah, all right, we got. Sweet. It'll be interesting. We got one in here yeah. about robust bash shell scripts, and this is probably one yes. that uh, I could go through myself. Yes. Uh, so it, it's basically telling you some tips you can do to make your bash scripts more robust. Uh, the very first example is one that hits close to home for uh, TechSnap here. You tell, if you put set minus u or uh, set minus o, no unset at the beginning of your shell script, mm -hmm. it will throw an error if you ever use a variable that's not defined. Mm -hmm. If Steam and Red Hat had done this, they wouldn't have accidentally erased your whole system a couple of times. Right. You remember that? Yep. If a certain variable didn't get defined correctly or was defined as blank, then the Steam script would actually erase your whole home directory instead of just your Steam directory. Woo! Or there was one with, I think it was LDAP or MySQL, some, something on Red Hat where if you installed it wrong, a uh, variable is missing, and it would erase, do rm minus rf on slash instead of on a certain directory. Um, <clears throat> so in both cases, if they had just done this set minus u at the beginning of their script, it would have caught the problem and stopped before it broke everything. Hmm. That's a good one right there, isn't it? And it, it shows there, uh, there's some examples of how it works. Hmm. Also talks about set minus e, which, or uh, error exit. Uh, which will basically mean as soon as any command throws an error, stop the script, right? Because that's the typically, you know, you put up like 10 commands in a shell script. Well, if the second one fails and the fourth one depends on that one, then if you don't have to do manual error checking, it's not going to work. Yeah. Whereas, uh, you know, if you do set minus E, then the script will automatically stop if any one of the commands returns an error. Mm, that's a great thing. And it'll save you, yeah, uh, and a bunch of other stuff like that. Uh, yeah, setting up traps. You know, program defensively, stuff. expect the unexpected, yeah. all kinds of things like that. Uh, you know, be prepared, be prepared for, for spaces, spaces and file names. File names. Yep. That's a big one. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> you have to quote everything. Yep. Uh, that's the one, you know, we've seen that bite people with uh, for loops over file names and a bunch of different stuff like that. Uh, you know, if you do touch foo bar and it ends up creating foo and bar and all kinds of crazy stuff. Uh, but yeah, it's got a whole bunch of really good examples of different things, uh, little things that will make a big difference in your shell script. The other one is uh, shellcheck.net, uh, where you can paste oh, in yes. your shell script or yep. get the program, and it will um, point out a bunch of errors in yeah. your code yeah. and common mistakes and help you yeah, we, uh, wow. make a better Boy, shell script. It's been script. a few months since we talked about that one. Good plug. Alan, you're a Firefox user, right? Mm -hmm. What do you think about this? Firefox optional tracking protection reduces load time for new sites by 40%. Four percent. That's according to a former Mozilla software engineer, Monica Chu, and the computer science researcher, Georgios Zaskanos, recently re released a PDF that explains Firefox's optional tracking protection feature. The duo found that the tracking protection, when it was enabled, the Alexia Top 200 news site saw a 67.5% reduction in the number of HTTP cookies set. Furthermore, performance benefits included a 44% median reduction in page load time and a 39% reduction in data usage. Which can make a big difference, especially on a phone where, you know, your data is more expensive and the longer it takes to download is more battery you're using on the Wi-Fi or the, the LTE modem and so on. Uh, so, yeah. Yes, news sites are full of ads and cookies. Yeah, yeah uh, check and out... The more uh, of those you can block, the faster it'll load. Uh, I, I, Lightbeam from uh, the Firefox folks, the Mozilla Foundation. Lightbeam is a really cool visualizer tool that shows you how all of the sites are interconnecting to track you. Uh, Third-party uh -huh. sites that you maybe don't even visit still get information about you. And if you, have a fire, if you use Firefox, check out Lightbeam. It's made by Mozilla, and it's, get this, illuminating. Now, Alan, Mac users might be a little more concerned about the physical security of their Mac now that we find out the Mac firmware is even completely more broken than we originally thought. And this time, with a right. rather... Well, Mm -hmm. I mean, this one, this particular, this particular flaw could potentially be exploited, maybe by somebody just downloading something maliciously, remotely. Yeah. So there was a, you know, last year at the Chaos Communication Congress, they talked about this one hack, and it was very hard to do to basically exploit the EFI firmware and inject a rootkit so that, and it would be there outside of the OS. So even if you reformatted, it would still be there. Um, but this guy found that actually, 
if you just sleep the Mac and wake it back up, the protection, the right protection on the BIOS goes away. And so then you can just Jeez. exploit now that it. Seems so like- as long as the MacBook has been to sleep for 30 seconds or so, when you wake it up, it's vulnerable. So you could have a process that just waits for the machine to wake back up and then write to the BIOS. Yeah, and then inject the rootkit. Uh, and and uh, so do and you... we're not quite so. So the original hack that was presented in 2014 was how you know you could basically inject your own script so that as you were unsuspending in the BIOS, you would take away the root the the um, the write protection. Turns out. No, I guess maybe nobody noticed, or it's only, it only applies to certain models, but it's a, quite a range of models. I don't think the newest ones have are affected yeah, by this, but like everything like 2013, 2014 yeah, definitely yes, are. Yeah, right, that's correct. Um, and it turns out that Apple script apparently actually unwrite protects it to do something and then forgot to rewrite protect it or something. So this could be something Apple could easily fix then? If Probably. they want to patch their uh, older computers. They fixed some stuff. Uh, they fixed one of the, the one where you could do it over Thunderbolt already. Uh, but, you know, it seems they've known about the possibility of this one since 2014, and it's just no one realized how easy it was to exploit until recently. Or the people that were looked at it last time happened to have hardware that wasn't exploitable, and somebody with it just found it. The, late, the latest Mac Pro, the trash can, vulnerable. MacBook 9, 1, vulnerable. MacBook Pro Retina 10, 1, vulnerable. It's the recent machines, Alan. Yep. That, that trash can is the latest Mac Pro available. It's vulnerable to this. Right, although some of the newer Mac uh, laptops yeah, are not. Yeah, and probably like the new iMac and stuff. Although he, he only had one to test on and it wasn't his and they wouldn't give him root access, so he's not entirely sure if it's vulnerable because yeah. he doesn't have one to test with. Hey, Alan, I've made an Android observation. Can I share it with you? Sure. It seems like whenever there's a bug or a flaw or a mistake in Android, it always is a mistake or a bug or a flaw that always ends up collecting a ton of data or information about users or fails to pri- properly protect user data. It's never like can't do something, therefore you don't. they can't collect data about you. No, no, it's always like your data is being spilled wide open. A flaw in Android factory reset failed to clear private data from some smartphones. Yeah, that's right. You go to do a factory reset to clear the phone before you get rid of it. And a before bug, you sell it or give it back to the store for yep. them as a trade-in or whatever, yep. and some of your data wasn't getting erased. Uh, Android devices from five different vendors found that more than 500 million Android devices don't completely erase data after a factory reset. Yeah. And uh, that includes uh, uh, problems up to those with Android 4.4, it looks like. Mm-hmm. Wow. I, I just got a notification from my phone that it wants me to upgrade to 5.1.1. Oh, do it. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, 5.1.1's good. 5.0, not okay. so good. HTC, Google, LG, Motorola, and Samsung all listed as the vendors. That means some of the Nexus devices as well. Uh, researchers were, were also able to extract the master token from 80% of the smartphones. Master tokens let you access most of the Google data, including the Gmail and Google Calendar on the device from the failure of this factory reset. So using that master token on the device, they're able to get So go Gmail buy some account. used phones and take over people's Gmail accounts? Yep, and then get access to all their things. That's why my old phone is here until I feel like mm-hmm. smashing now, we talked about this one, and boy, we both were kind of like, boy, this doesn't sound quite right. Well, that story about yeah. SSDs losing data as they sit on the shelf, it's been debunked. Not quite, but the original researchers uh, pointed out to clarify, people read only the slide they were interested dun, in. Dun, dun, dun. Only, uh, their tests that were saying, you know, an SSD powered off could start losing data were tests on hard drives that were already at the end of their life. So the SSD was already worn out and passed its warranty. Uh, and that's when they were doing testing them for a long time, or uh, uh, leaving them on a shelf. They already warned a heck of it. Yeah. So if a, a new SSD or even one that's you know not at the end of its life will be fine, even at higher temperatures. Uh, it's just if you take an SSD that's already been in service for three years in a data center and it's been re- written more times than the warranty counts yeah, for, yeah. Uh, and then you put it on a shelf where it's really hot, then it's going to degrade. <laughs> Yeah, like 85 degrees hot or hotter. Something like that. Is that what the story says? Yeah, something like 85, 90 degrees hot. They have they have it. They have right. the chart. You know, data centers can be hot if you don't have enough cooling. Yep. Yeah, especially like in a little storage area or something. And so, yes, if you're roasting the hard drive, the SSDs, Makes then sense. yes, they're yeah. going to die. All right, Alan. Well, that brings us to but the yeah, end of the You don't the have round to round. worry about, oh, I unplugged the right. SSD out of my laptop and it's been a week. If I don't plug it back in, I'm going to lose all well, my data. I was like, geez, I got like, a, I got like an SSD that's been sitting up on a, on, a, on a shelf for a month in my office while I wait for a machine. Mm-hmm. So 
Uh, all right. So if you'd like to join, uh, add something to the roundup, I should say, go to techsnap.reddit.com and submit the story there or vote on it or comment on it. That would also be good. Now, we will not be live next week. We're double recording today for the trip to BSD Can. But normally the TechSnap show is live on Thursdays at 2 p.m. Pacific, uh, which, Alan, what is that? What, what, what is that in some fancy time? Uh, 4 p.m. Eastern, 2000 UTC. Oh, I said 2 p.m. I meant 1 p.m. Did I mess you up? I got no, some, I didn't okay. listen to you. I just yeah. said what I always I say. I thought so. I thought so. Uh, so, yeah, we do it at 1 p.m. Uh, you can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get that in your local times. And don't forget, we also have RSS feeds. You just grab the show weekly. And it doesn't matter if we're recording a couple at a time or once a week. You just get it when we release them, which we do every single week. Well, at least for 217 weeks in a row. All right, everybody. Well, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of TechSnap. We'll see you right back here next week. Bye.